lots of things to cover today. Um, first of all, this week in the lab, on your syllabus it says we're doing experiments 10 and 11. The doing is experiment 11, so elimination reaction with your alcohol from last week. Experiment 10 discusses um, GC, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, but the actual, what you put in your pre-lab is experiment 11. And remember, your pre-lab should be unique to what alcohol you're starting with from last week, and therefore we're going to make unique um, products based on that alcohol. Um, you'll have a quiz this week. Your experiment 7 report is due. You'll be handing in your notebook, so make sure that you have your notebook all together, your conclusions in your notebook, ready to go. Also, um, as a little hint and reminder, at the end of each um, experiment, there's usually a paragraph or two that has information about what you should include in your conclusion. So make sure you read that over for experiment seven. Make sure you have all the pieces in there, um, including one of the things is out, uh, you need to calculate the number of repeat units in your polymer chain from your DPC, so keep that in mind. Um, next week we'll be doing experiment 12. So again, on your syllabus, it'll say experiment 12 and experiment 13. The doing is experiment 12, so if you work ahead on your pre-lab, that will be the pre-lab for next week. And then in two weeks, your experiment 8 and 11 report will be due. So experiment 8 and 11, because they're related to each other, you're going to hand in one report for both of them. You will have a separate pre-lab and separate experimental for each experiment. So keep experiment eight pre-lab and experimental separate from experiment 11 pre-lab and experimental. But you will write a common conclusion. So make sure um, you keep all your bookkeeping correct for experiment eight and 11. And then at the end, you will use all the GC data that you um, collect to write a common conclusion. Um, a note for next week, not this week, um, Open Lab Friday, so a week from this Friday on the 15th, we'll be closing at 2.30 because there's a division seminar at 3, so keep that in mind if you need to use Open Lab a week from this Friday. And now, uh, registration notes for Chem 256. So, um, as you are registering this week for um, spring semester for Chem 256 Lab, first of all, if you only need to take 231 lecture and you don't need Chem 256 lab, Chem 256 lab, don't register for Chem 256 lab because if you register for the lab and you don't need it, you're taking a spot away from someone who does. So don't register for the lab if you don't need the lab. Um, now what that will make you do is you can't register for lecture without lab, so what you need to do is just go to the registrar's office they will take care of the override and get you into the right lecture section. But make sure you do that this week so that you can get into the right time for what you need. For, um, or if it gets to the point that when you register, registration is full for lecture, get yourself on the wait list that you need, okay? For Chem 256 lab, if you do need lab, make sure that you register correctly for either one credit or two credit. Don't select the zero credit option. If you select the zero credit option, I'm going to think that you got into lab and you don't really need lab, okay? So pick one credit if you're taking it for one credit, pick two credits if you're taking it for two credits. If when you go to register the lab section that you need, so not you want, but you need based on your schedule, um, is closed, email me with what lab you need based on your class schedule and the reason you, or reasons you need that lab, and how many credits you need to register for that lab, okay? Also put yourself on the wait list for that lab. So next week when I deal with wait lists, I can't handle wait lists for any person that is not on the wait list. So if you need a lab and email me, but don't put yourself on the wait list, I still can't help you. So you have to be on the wait list and you need to email me so I, need, so I know what lab section you need to get into and why you need that lab section, okay? Then I can put all the pieces together and get everybody where they need to be, all right? But make sure if you can't get into the lab section you need, you wait list, email me with your information, okay? And do that right away because starting Friday afternoon, I'm going to start dealing with wait lists. So as soon as possible, if you get on a wait list, send me the email. Don't wait till Monday night 
because by next Monday night, I will have wait lists all worked out and probably have sent it already to the registrar's office. Okay. All right. Um, and if you have any questions with registration, let me know too. A little bit of review from last week, what you guys were doing, um, and reminders for if you need to finish your fractional distillation. So experiment eight, we were making an alcohol, or everybody was making an alcohol, and you varied in aldehyde and alkyl bromide um, as to what you were putting in, into your reaction. In the end, you were making, there were four different alcohols that were being made, either three heptanol, four heptanol, three octanol, or four octanol, okay? So it's what these possibilities with either R being H or R being a methyl group. If you have not completed your fractional distillation, make sure this week when you do it in lab before you do experiment 11, you know the boiling point of the alcohol that you have. So make sure you know for sure the alcohol that you have made and then what that atmospheric boiling point should be. For the heptanols, it should be in the 150s. For the octanols, it should be in the 170s, okay? So there shouldn't be anything that you want that boils under 100 degrees. If you find a boiling point that's lower than that, then what we need to do is use what's called a nomograph in the Aldrich catalogs because you found a under vacuum boiling point and we will approximate what that boiling point should be at atmospheric temperature, okay? But make sure before you start the fractional distillation, you know what boiling point you, you need so you don't throw away something because you didn't distill it at the right boiling point, all right? Once you are done with the fractional distillation, there's two things you're going to need from your experiment eight product. You're going to need to prepare a GC sample, and towards the end of the lab lecture, I'll tell you how to do that. And you need an IR spectrum. You also will need, so I guess, sorry, three things. Um, probably before all this, as always, you will need a yield, and then you will need to prepare a GC sample and then an IR spectrum. You may have multiple fractions from your um, fractional distillation that is close to your um, boiling point, so you'll have to decide what you're going to count and what you're not going to count for your yield. Um, your purest fraction used for GC sample and IR spectrum, okay? Before you leave lab this week, we need your GC sample. Um, for the IR spectrum, uh, you can wait to do that. Just make sure you set aside just a little bit um, to do that. And remember, you need a couple drops at most to do an IR sample, okay? So instead of delaying getting experiment 11 started, don't do the IR, collect the IR spectrum, wait, but make sure you've set aside just a little bit to do that, all right? So then once you have your alcohol, um, then we're going to go on and do experiment 11. So you got to keep, you're doing, probably doing 8 and 11 and things for both in the same lab period. So you got to keep things straight on both ends and like, as I reminded you earlier, make sure you keep your experimentals separate too. Experiment 8 on separate pages from experiment 11. So then once you have your alcohol, then we're going to go on and perform elimination reaction. So if we pretend we're starting here with two hexanol, for our example, I'm going to go through this mechanism kind of quickly because um, I've heard that you guys should know this forwards, backwards, upside down. So we'll just go through it quickly um, to remind you and help remind you for your exam on Friday. So we are using an acid, so we need to protonate our alcohol, and then we form this very fine leaving group, water. And so we're going to get our water to leave. And then what type of elimination reaction is this? Why is it E1? You're correct. It left without terminations. What was that? It left <laughs> without the So now I've kind of fared. Two steps. So you've got an intermediate, right? We're going to make and move this guy over here. I got to move this guy over. Then he'll look like that guy over. So 
we've got our carbocation intermediate, right? And so it is an E1. If you have an intermediate, it's an E1 elimination mechanism. And so then from this, we can form a variety of products depending on what alkenes we make. So we can make our one hexene. Or we can make our cis and trans two hexene. Um, and so you guys will be looking at what possible products you're going to form. Now, of all this, what would be the most favored products here? And of that one even, the trans is going to be um, the most favored. But that doesn't mean you won't see the other possibilities. So just because a product is more favored, you'll see more <coughs> of it potentially, but doesn't mean that you won't um, see the other possibilities. Okay? And we're going to start with, we've got one more carbon on here. So um, a predominant product wouldn't be a primary alkene, but there is a possibility that you will even see primary alkenes in your, in your um, product mixture. So keep in mind that just because it's the predominant product doesn't mean everything in there is going to form in that manner. Um, now another thing to keep in mind, because it is an E1 mechanism, so we've got this intermediate. Say we've got, we'll go back to our um, carbocation here. What can happen to that carbocation? Because we are at equilibrium. shift to an equally stable spot. So we could move um, to the three position here, and it'd be equally as stable as we were before. But it can happen, because you are at equilibrium. Okay. So don't be surprised if you see um, products due to rearrangement because of this hydride shift as well. Okay. Um, now things to keep in mind with that is Zaitsev's rule. So what does Zaitsev's rule say? Or the more substituted alkene is going to be your predominant product, right? You're going to want a more substituted carbocation, which will lead to the more substituted alkene. Okay. Now, does Zaitsev's rule say anything about cis and trans ratios? No. So just, I, I put that out there as caution. As you're thinking about your conclusions in a couple weeks, remember that Zaitsev's rule never said anything about what ratio of cis and trans you're going to have. Okay? It just says that it's talking about the substituted alkene, and the more substitute the alkene, the more, um, more substituted alkenes will be more major products. Okay? Um, so trans, like we talked about, um, will predominate over cis. And usually, because looking at Zaitsev's rule, in comparison of one hexene to two hexene, you're going to see more two hexene products than you are of your one hexene products. Okay? So keep all of these. Um, 
rules in mind as you're looking at and identifying what products you have in your reaction mixture because it's easy a lot of times in looking at your results to come up with reaction mixtures that don't follow these rules but in general you're going to be following these rules okay so you'll have to maybe do a little bit more in-depth analysis to figure out how these rules can be followed um, Another thing to keep in mind is we use sulfuric acid for this reaction. We don't use HCl. Now, why is that? So, sulfuric acid, after this reaction, you're going to get this, right? HO4, HSO4 minus. Is that a good nucleophile? No. No. Okay, which is good. We don't want a good nucleophile. Because um, if we have a good nucleophile, what is also a possibility instead of elimination? Substitution. Substitution. Okay? So if we use this instead, is um, Cl minus a good nucleophile? Yes. 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 And so we don't want to use HCl because we would get substitution and elimination or more substitution and eliminate elimination. We wouldn't get the predominant product that we want, okay? So that is why we use sulfuric acid, okay? And uh, we've got this reaction that is at equilibrium. We're using a good concentrated um, type of sulfuric acid, so just like or molarity, just like you used last week, we've got our nine molar sulfuric acid, okay? And unlike last week where you eventually end up diluting it, this week we're gonna use straight nine molar sulfuric acid and we're going to boil it, okay? So be careful with it. Um, make sure you wear gloves, make sure during the distillation you keep your hood sash down. Um, be really careful in handling this, all right? Now you're going to use for this um, reaction, we're going to use what is called a steam distillation. <coughs> and so you're going to set up a regular simple distillation. One thing you're going to do is you're going to collect all of your volume in the 25 milliliter graduated cylinder, okay, so you're going to set up a simple distillation, but your collection vessel is your 25 milliliter graduated cylinder, and during the process of this reaction, we've got your 9 molar sulfuric acid and your alcohol in the reaction pot, and so what's going to come over is this mixture of acidic water vapor, okay, so it's basically acid acid water vapor here, plus your alkene are going to distill over. And so this combination here of a vapor, water vapor type of thing coming over along with the product that you want is called a steam distillation, right? Um, and so be really careful even on the collection end, you're still going to be collecting um, this 9 molar sulfuric acid. So it's not just going to stay in the reaction pot, it's going to come over with your alkene. And your distillation, you will end once you are done collecting the organic layer. Okay, so in your graduated cylinder, once everything cools down, you're going to have layers in your graduated cylinder. Okay, and so what is going to be the top layer? Organic, because our alkene is still less dense than our 9 molar sulfuric. So you have an organic layer and an aqueous layer. So once that organic layer stops growing, you are done with your steam distillation. You are not going to distill all 50 milliliters of sulfuric acid over. You're just going to distill enough until you're certain that you're done collecting in that organic layer, and then you're going to cool it down. Okay, And once you're done collecting, Turn off the heat, let everything cool down very um, carefully, very slowly. Um, we're not going to handle anything until everything is completely cooled down because you don't want to handle anything that's still hot with all that acid residue. And you're going to have acid 
throughout in your adapters, in your condenser, in your graduated cylinder. Okay, so you want to be careful handling it. Make sure everything's put down to room temperature. Um, now, during this distillation, you're going to be monitoring a boiling point, but it's not going to be the boiling point of your alkene or your 9 molar sulfuric acid. It's going to be a combination of those boiling points, okay? So lower than 9 molar sulfuric acid, sometimes higher or right about or in the ballpark of your alkenes, okay? But you've got a mixture of two things, so it's not going to be um, the boiling point of something singularly. It's a mixture boiling point. So don't expect, if it's not boiling where your alkenes should boil, that's okay because it's not going to do that. It's a mixture that's coming over, all right? Now once you're done with everything cooling down, carefully handle your graduated cylinder, put it in a very, very safe place. We don't want to lose this precious little alkene here that you're going to have now. We've worked on it for two weeks, and we will have a couple milliliters of product, okay? You'll have like two to five milliliters of product, okay? So we have to be really careful with that. Your distillation pot with all that nine molar sulfuric acid, we now we've got to do something with it. And organic waste is not a good place for concentrated acid because a lot of organics react with acid, okay? And nine molar sulfuric is still fairly concentrated. So what you're going to need to do is take your biggest beaker, fill it about halfway full with water, and once everything is completely cooled down, you're going to carefully pour that uh, pot mixture into that beaker of water, and then all of that will go down the sink with a lot of water down the sink, okay? But do not put that acid mixture into the organic waste. All right, so acid mixture not in organic waste, acid mixture down the sink after it's been diluted in a beaker of water, all right? And throughout this time, again, you're adding acid to water. Um, be very careful doing that. Don't get it on you, all right? Okay, so now we have our little alkene here. We now, now are going to separate our layers. And to do that, we need to use our separatory funnel. So again, careful, we don't have a lot. So make sure stopcock is closed. Um, take all the precautions you can to make sure that you don't lose your alkene. You're going to separate off the um, acid layer, and then you're going to wash the sodium bicarbonate, just like you did last week. You want to make sure that you've got a neutral pH once you're done with that wash. And then, just like we did last week, we've got to dry with magnesium sulfate. But again, we just, our organic layer is just alkene. There's no solvent there, okay? So you've got to be really careful with that magnesium sulfate. Only use what you need to use. Don't use any more than that. Because you're not going to use a solvent to wash that alkene off that magnesium sulfate. You're just going to... Um, I'm going to show you in a minute here how you're going to filter it off, but you've got to filter off your alkene away from that magnesium sulfate, and you're not going to have anything to clean it up with, okay? So be really careful um, in drying with mag sulfate that you don't lose all your product in the magnesium sulfate. Only use what you need to make it dry. And so to filter it, instead of filtering it um, with regular fluted filter paper for gravity filtration, we're still going to do a gravity filtration. But we're going to use, so this is why experiment nine is still in your lab manual, is for this picture right here. Oh. <clears throat> you're going to, you're going to have a vial that you know the mass of, okay, so that you can get the yield of your alkene. <coughs> and you're going to make a pipette that has a little bit of a Kim White stuffed in the bottom of the pipette. And we've got little, um, the ends of cotton applicators with little flags on them, little wooden sticks to help you get a little bit of chem wipe in there. And we'll show you this week how to do that. You're going to put the chem wipe in there. And then you're going to pipette your magnesium sulfate alkene mixture through this pipette down. And then it should filter down into the vial without any solid. Okay, so make sure what goes into this vial um, doesn't have any solid. Make sure that it is dry. Um, make sure it's not cloudy. Make sure it looks like nice, dry, clean, organic material. 
So then we can analyze it by GC, all right? Then once you have all your alkene filtered, we're not rinsing this with anything. Once it's filtered through, that's it, okay? Then you can get the yield of your alkene. And then just like um, experiment eight, so we need experiment 11 product. You need the yield, and then you'll make a GC sample. And you'll collect an IR spectrum. And then once you have that alkene, um, make sure you cap it so we don't lose it, doesn't get tipped over, um, and take really good care of it so we don't, don't lose it at this point, all right? If you still get solid in here after you filtered, you'll just have to make a new pipette and refilter it again, okay? Um, make sure that the vial that you go into that you're going to know the weight of, make sure it's clean, make sure it's dry. Um, we can't put anything on the GC that has any solid matter in it, and we can't put anything on the GC that has any water in it. So we want to make sure there's no water residue in anything, and there's no solid left because it'll end up ruining the GC column. Okay. Um, another thing with your IR spectra from 8 and 11, just like with your unknown from experiment 6 and like your um, product from polystyrene, you want a standard IR spectrum to compare your data to what you made. Okay. So you want to look up an IR spectrum for the alcohol that you made and an IR spectrum from, for the predominant alkene that you should have made. If you can't find a liquid neat IR spectrum for either your alcohol or your alkene, use something that it's closely related to. So like the alcohol, say you made 4-octanol. You can't find the IR spectrum for 4-octanol, but you can find the IR spectrum for 3-octanol. Use 3 octanols IR spectrum to compare it. But if you made 4 octanol and all you can find is 1 octanol, that's not going to be a really good comparison because you've got a secondary alcohol compared with a primary alcohol for the literature. So that's going to be a different, the IR spectra are going to be too different. Okay? So you need to find things, if you can't find the one, find something very close to the one. Alright? But don't don't go too far out there that it's not, not completely um, going to look like what you made, all right? So experiment 8 and 11, you need a literature spectrum that you're going to be comparing your IR data to, all right? So then what we are going to do once we have your um, GC samples, then we will picture didn't come out so great on the overhead. It's a lot better looking in your lab manual. But the GCs we're going to use are actually, it's not this guy here, it's the one behind it. We're going to load all these samples on the GC. Okay. And so in a little bit here I'm going to talk to you about prepping your GC samples because um, we need to do it such that we've got um, samples that will work really well on our auto sampler and not make it unhappy because we've got 120-ish of you, you all have two samples that need to be run, we have standards that need to be run, we've got to keep this guy running for like six days straight, okay? So we need to um, make sure we make good samples for it so it doesn't get unhappy. So the GC, we've already talked about one form of chromatography, we had um, gel permeation chromatography. Now we're going to talk about gas chromatography. And we, um, what we need this for is to look at both our alcohol and what are all um, the impurities possibly in our alcohol besides just our alcohol, and then the alkenes their boiling points are too close to separate even with fractional dis distillation. So 
So um, gas chromatography is a way to do that. It's an analytical technique, just like GPC was. And what you get is a partitioning. So we'll talk about what this means in a little bit here. Of the sample. Between our mobile phase, so remember with GPC we talked about a mobile phase and a stationary phase. So every time we have chromatography, we're going to be talking about a mobile phase and a stationary phase. So our mobile phase is a carrier gas, and our stationary phase. and the stationary phase, all right? And the um, liquid that's attached to the GC column. So, um, with the capillary GC, so we'll look at this basic um, diagram instead of looking at the picture here. You're gonna have your sample is going to come into the ejector. It's going to run through this column, and these columns are very long. They're very thin, it's called capillary. Um, GC because they are, they're like very, very, very thin. Thinner than your melting point capillaries um, is how thin that column is. And it's very long, it's just coiled all together. So your sample is going to come into the injector, go through the column, it will get separated through that column, come out the detector, and then we've got a computer hooked up to it that will print out the results of what, what came out of that detector and tell you what you've got into your gut in your sample. So um, gas chromatography, especially with the detector that we use, which I'll talk about here in a minute, is a very sensitive technique and it will pick up pretty much everything that it sees in that sample. So be really careful when you have your samples, once you've purified your alcohol, once you have your pure alkene, make sure that it doesn't get contaminated with anything because you will see that contamination in your um, GC and you may or may not be able to identify what that contamination is, okay? So keep, once you've cleaned up your samples, keep them clean. So the first part of the GC is the injector. So your, um, the auto sampler is sitting up here and then here's our injector. It takes a sample and then fills up needle with a tiny little bit of sample and then it will inject it right into this injector and what happens in this in this injector is it's very very hot and it's got carrier gas traveling through it okay so it vaporizes the sample right here at the injector then it goes down to the capillary column and then as it goes on to the column it's actually cooled back down Okay, so it's like 200, 250 degrees here, and then it goes down to this column where it's like 40, 50 degrees, all right? But you vaporize the sample, travels down to our column, then on the column, you've got this vapor coming onto your column that now has cooled down, and then you're going to the oven that the column is in, you are changing the temperature of the column. So you've got this constant ramping up of temperature of the column itself. Okay? And so as it does that, it then vaporizes that sample again, and so you're going to get um, gas eventually traveling through that column or um, gas then separating out from what is left of that sample. So with GC, what we are separating based on is volatility of your sample. How volatile is your sample? The more volatile it is, 
the faster it will travel through the column, the less volatile it is, the slower it will go through the column. Okay? So when you get your um, chromatogram, you have peaks that have come off earlier and peaks that have come off later. Things that came off earlier were more, more volatile, things that came off later were less volatile. Okay? And so as that column heats up, things start separating out based on their volatility. And so as it travels through that column, and again, it's meters of column, as it travels through that column, then you get good separation. And this is kind of like an in view, a very large, <coughs> blown up view of the column. You've got the outer um, casing of the column, and then you've got the support here of the column, and then you've got this liquid polymer on the inside of the column. That is your stationary phase. And so you've got this vaporization and, um, and partitioning on the column based on how volatile that sample is. So the more volatile sample will spend less time going into the liquid, partitioning into the liquid of the column, and less time, or less time in the liquid of the column, more time in the carrier gas. The less volatile sample will spend more time partitioning in the liquid of the column, less time in the carrier gas. So that partitioning, as well as the volatility, is how you get that increased separation out of the column itself. And so the column that we use um, is for most part, the most part a pretty non-polar column. So you're not going to really see a difference in polarity of compounds going through. It is just predominantly based on boiling points and volatility of the compounds as they're going through the column. Okay? And so in your lab manual, um, it gives you some structures and some compositions of different types of columns depending on what you need to use the column for. Um, you can use different columns based on their, what they are made up of. So here's some non-polar columns. Here's one that's kind of intermediate polarity and these are really polar compounds. So depending on what you're trying to separate out, you will use um, the columns for different things. Even though down here alcohols is listed, a relatively non-polar column will work for what, what we're trying to do because the, the alcohols are so much different boiling point from your alkenes, all right? And so for your pre-lab to help you kind of preliminarily try and figure out what, how things are going to loot um, for your GC traces, you should figure out what your major products are going to be from your alcohol and the elimination, and then look up the boiling points of those alkenes, as many alkenes as you can find, so you have an idea of the difference between alkene boiling point and your alcohol boiling point, okay? So then once the sample has traveled through the column, it comes out into the detector. So there, we have to have a mechanism to be able to figure out what is coming off of that column, and that is called the detector. The type of, of detector that we use is a flame ionization detector. So this detector is very, very sensitive. It's a very good detector. So what you have is your sample is still in its carrier gas. It's just come off the column and it's now been separated out by volatility. So it's coming off based on that separation. So we've got this carrier gas coming through. We also have some hydrogen gas that's mixing with that carrier gas. And then we also have some air that's also mixing with it. And so what happens is you have your um, sample coming through and it gets ionized in this flame, okay, in this mixture of carrier gas and hydrogen gas, your sample itself gets basically charred up and ionized, okay? And you've got some current kind of running around this flame itself so that you've got these different ions that are going to come out of the flame, basically. Then you have this ion collector, so something then to collect all these ions. And as the ions are, you're basically um, ionizing and charring your sample, as the pieces come off, you're then um, going to collect those ions on this collector 
and it will detect that something is there based on electric current. Okay, so you're making a current because if you you have these ions, and that current will be equal to how much you have. So magnitude of current is proportional to how much stuff you have. So you can figure out what is coming off and how much of it is coming off. So you're getting stuff coming off at a specific retention time and it's quantitative to how much of it was in that sample, all right? And so then from this detector, it's all going into the computer and it will spit out a printout for you so you can figure out what you have, okay? And so what you will end up with is something, something like this, where you have a chromatogram, and you have all these peaks coming off of it, and then you get a printout. So this page and this page will be two separate things. I've just put them together so you can see what is happening. So you've got things that are separated into these peaks, and then you have percentages based on what those peaks, what was in each of those peaks, okay? So these percentages correspond to how much stuff was in there for each of those peaks. And so then you can identify what your stuff is and how much of it was in your sample, right? And so this is an example of an experiment 11 um, sample. So we've got over here was the alkenes, and over here is the alcohol. So there's that much difference in boiling point that you see minutes in difference of retention time. So you can definitely see the difference between alkenes and alcohol. But then the alkenes themselves, they are so closely related. So you've got 2.65 minutes, 2.687 minutes, 2.722 minutes, 2.817 minutes. Those are all really close together. And by fractional distillation, you wouldn't have been able to separate them. The only way to separate them is by GC, okay? And so here is a whole clump of alkenes. So what you will get from your instructor is your GC data back for eight and 11. And then you will have a table of standard retention times. So you need a way to figure out what is what, okay? And so we will give you this table of standard retention times and you will compare your data to those standard retention times to figure what you have, figure out what you have in your data. Now, for the alcohols, we'll give you retention times for all four alcohols, okay? But the alkenes, there's far too many alkene possibilities for us to give you all of the standard retention times. So you will see trends in those retention times, and you will have to use those trends as well as the retention times that you're given to figure out what is in your mixture, okay? And so with this comes into play when I was talking about trans will predominate over cis. So usually if you have a, some, something that's a cis compound, you're gonna have a trans compound with it, okay? And things that follow Zaitsev's rule. So you'll have to use all of those things to figure out what is in your reaction mixture, okay? as well as the trends in that GC data that you are given, the standard data. And then from that, you will figure out what is in your mixture. So for the alcohols, there's probably not going to be a whole lot, okay? You'll have your alcohol, you may have some other impurities. Um, one thing you need to watch out for, and I talked about last week, is your alcohol can decompose to the corresponding um, ketone. So you may see a little bit of a compound that boils before or comes off before your alcohol, that's the ketone. But then experiment 11 will get more complex because you'll have all your alkenes in there, okay? So you really need to think about what you put in there and what are the possibilities for what could come out and then look at that relative to your data to figure out what's going on with your data, all right? Now something else that you need to record is on the front of the GC that we will use, you will have all of this information. So you've got this table in your lab manual. You need to visit the GC that is running all these samples and record all of this information, okay? And put it in either experiment eight or experiment 11, but you need to get all of this information in there, okay? Now one thing else you want to look at so here is normal size of just 
the peak list from GC data. Anything below two minutes, you want to disclude from your GC data. Okay, so you're going to have to, um, if you have anything that comes off below two minutes, you'll have to disclude from your GC data, and then you'll have to recalculate based on that GC data. Okay, so you've got peak areas and percentage of total. So it, say we want to disclude our 2.65 peak. Say instead it was below two minutes. So we would subtract this area, and we would just add up these areas to get a new total, okay? And then we would take each of these areas divided by that new total to come up with a new percentage. So if you have anything about below two minutes, you have to recalculate your areas for your GC data, all right? And then what you are going to produce is in your um, notebook, you want to give, so table 10.2 gives you a GC table, an example of GC table. You want to use this example for your GC table. So look at table 10.2 in your lab manual and use this as an example for how to set up your GC table. So you need a GC table for experiment 8 and a GC table for experiment 11. And so you're going to give one column is going to give you standard retention times, so you give all the standard retention times that you have, what the retention time is from your data, the area from your data, the percentage from your data, and what that identity is, okay? So even though you potentially don't have a um, standard retention time for a certain piece of data, you need to extrapolate from that data what that peak is and try and figure out what it is in that alkene region. So say we didn't know that at 2.81, cis-2-heptene came off. Well, we've got trans-3-heptene, cis-3-heptene, trans-2-heptene, so what would probably be the <coughs> other product, the corresponding cis-2-heptene, okay? So once you get your data, it's going to take a little bit to put all the pieces together, so don't save the analysis for the very last minute because it's going to take some time to get through all that data and figure out what's going on. For the GC sample specifically, so before you leave this week, we need two GC samples, one for experiment eight and one for experiment 11. So as soon as we have our samples, we're going to be throwing them on that GC because we need to keep feeding it as constantly as possible with samples to keep all the samples running through, get everybody's data collected so we can give it back to you next week or um, by next week. So you've got two GC samples. If your alcohol and your alkene are completely dry with no solids, you can use the method I'm going to tell you to prepare your GC samples, okay? So you can take one drop of your product, either experiment eight or experiment 11, and you're gonna have a separate sample for each. So experiment eight sample, experiment 11 sample. One drop of your product, put it in the GC vial. The GC vials are in the ADA hoods. So not in the reagent hoods, but in the ADA hoods. You're going to put it in a GC vial, and you're going to fill to the neck of the vial with pentane. And the pentane that you're going to use is in the ADA hood as well. Okay? And then you're going to cap the vial. To make sure that we don't have trouble with the auto sampler, you need to make sure don't cap those vials too tightly. So if you cap the vial and you see a little dimple in the, in the cap, it's on there too tight, loosen it a little bit, okay? So we want it on so everything won't evaporate, but we don't want it so tight that you actually see a dimple in the top of the vial, because there's a little septum in that vial that um, the needle's gonna go through from the auto sampler. You don't wanna make a, a dimple in that um, septum, because then the auto sampler needle gets angry after a while and will stop running, okay? So cap the vial. Um, you want it tight, but not too tight, okay? So no dimples. 
then there's two things you need to do with it, okay? There's a sample block that you are going to put it in, in your lab. And they are per lab section. And you've got, so on the sample block, there's going to be a row of numbers, and then two um, places that you can put samples. So say we've got one, two, three, four, five. This corresponds to your drawer number, so find the row that goes to your drawer number. So if you are 3A, you want to find row 3, you're going to put, you're going to put experiment 8 in this first column and experiment 11, GC sample in that second column, okay? Before you put your sample in there, we need to label it, label the GC vial, okay? And so you want to use initials and notebook page, so like TLS 40, that will be experiment 8. Remember, we're keeping experiment 8 and experiment 11 on separate notebook pages, so you sh should have same initials but different notebook page for experiment 11. This is your file name for the GC, so you do want different file names. You want different things in it, okay? And you will put these in Sharpie on your <coughs> GC vial, okay? So label your GC vial, put it in the right place on the sample block, and then there's going to be a sheet of paper, and you're going to have your name, drawer number, and then you're going to have a place to enter your experiment 8, and then experiment 11 sample. So make sure you put, say we've got drawer 3, we put in our name, we put in our sample numbers, Make sure that this is all legible because when I go to put things into the computer, I'm going to take it from this sheet, okay? So if you wrote something that looks like something else, that something else is going to be entered, and then if you can't find your data next week, it's because I entered something else in there. So make sure it's very legible what you want your file names to be called so you can find your data. And these file names will be printed at the top of your data, okay? okay. So just be really careful with the GC sample prep and then where you put it and how you label it.